I do want to get into the Word, though. I do, I do have a message for us this morning. The name above all names. We're going to consider the name of Jesus. That's the, the title of this message today. The name above all names. Consider Jesus. As, and as in preparing for this, last week we celebrated Easter. And, and did you know that most churches have such a significant drop off after Easter that this has been deemed like... Some churches, some regions would say this is the least attended service of the year, but you make that different here at Park West. That is not the case. Uh, but globally, you're like in the top 3% of people because you're at church today. So there you go. You're in the top 3%. You, you've, done, you've done well. But uh, uh, as we come out of Easter, a lot of pastors and people, we, we start thinking about those first disciples. And, and I did this this week. I, I read about Doubting Thomas. I don't know if any of you did that this week. I read about him, and, and that's such, he gets such a bad rap. He should be called Confessing Thomas. So I, I crafted or put together through the, through the Holy Spirit a great message about Confessing Thomas and, and that week and eight days following Easter uh, and, and his ascension, Christ's ascension, actually. But I said, no, that, that, that's not exactly where the Lord brought me. It's not so much about what happened here on earth those eight days after Christ's crucifixion. But what happened in heaven after his ascension? So yes, it's important how the disciples managed, and we can glean, we can learn from how Thomas uh, navigated and ended up confessing, my Lord and my God. We can learn a lot from that. But what happened in heaven? What happened those few days after the ascension? And that's what brings me to this today. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9, a, a powerful scripture. I, I believe that I quoted it last week. You know, we had three services last week, three services. And I learned something. I'm not built for three. After the third service in the foyer, I was greeting people. You know, we, we try to do this, get me out there so I can talk to people. They tell me that you like that. I don't know. I don't like to talk to me. So, but anyway, I, I was going out into the foyer after the third service out there greeting people and talking. Three families. If you're here today, I love you. Forgive me. I told three families last week, Merry Christmas. <laughs> I mean, third service, boom, wall, hit, done. I was like, I think one of y'all looked at me like, are you trying to pull something on me that you're saying, you know, I won't be here until Christmas? That was not my intention at all. I was just so tired. But this is what happened in heaven after Easter. Paul writing about the cross. Paul writing about transformation and salvation. He says, therefore, God, therefore, based on the cross of Calvary, based on Jesus looking at it, scorning the shame, but enduring it because he said, there is some joy set before me. There is salvation on the other side of the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. Now, this isn't just like... Well, I mean, this really wasn't a ceremony here where we presented the, the certificate to, to Bobby and to Caleb, but, but I didn't bestow anything on them. But I believe what happened in heaven as a denomination has bestowed a, a title on these gentlemen and bestowed a title on me and an academic institution can bestow a title. Can you imagine in heaven when God, creator of all, bestowed upon Jesus? Not just a religious thing, not just a, a, a theological thing, but, but heaven itself, God himself, bestowed on Jesus the name that is above every other name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Every theological, even atheist knees, even uh, philosophical knees, even academic knees, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ, Christos, is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 
Why do we sing like we did? Why do we worship? Why do we pray? Why do we confess? Why do we do what we do? Because he is worthy of glory. The name that is above every other name, when I am tired, when I feel like I have inhaled half of East Tennessee yesterday mowing my yard, and I can't hear out of this ear. Like every syllable, my ear's like, what, huh, who, huh? When you don't feel like it, when you're tired and when you're wore out, he's worthy of praise. It's not about an emotional response. You don't have to cry like I do. You don't have to bounce and jump like I do. You don't have to do any of that, but you ought to be touched. You ought to have some kind of feeling, and your emotion might be a laugh. It might be a pause. It might be a reflection, but there ought to be something within you that gives worship and awe and reverence to the name that is above every other name. Amen? His name is above cancer. His name is above divorce. His name is above abuse. His name is above addiction. His name is above atheism and and every ideology out there that competes against him. His name is worthy, amen? Hallelujah to the glory of God the Father. As Paul will write just a little bit before that, he'll say, for to me to live is Christ. In other words, his name is so much bigger. Everything I do is for his name. And to die is gain. So if I'm living, it's just because of his name. And if, it's, if I die, I'm there face to face with the one that holds the name. And this is how Paul can write this. Hebrews chapter 3, the author of Hebrews 3 will say this. And this is really where the message started for me. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in a heavenly calling, and you have been called by the prophet Jesus, he has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And share in this heavenly call. Consider Jesus. That's the entire intent and message of this sermon today. Consider Jesus. Ruminate, meditate, consider, think upon Jesus. He is the apostle, the high priest of our confession, counted worthy of more glory than of Moses. And we build on Christos, Christ, the anointed one. Later in Hebrews, the writer will say, fixing our eyes upon Jesus the originator, the author, and the finisher, or the completer of our faith. And if in our day and age, uh, I don't think we could need more of Christ than we do right now. This culture in which we live is so broken, so narcissistic, so perverted, so demonically influenced. Any longer, it's not even a covert, it is just overt, it is wide open that demonic things are being flaunted in front of us and we're being told to accept it as normal. There is a normalization of demonic activity and perversion in the world today. And our society needs Jesus, the name that is above every other name. We've got a sexual confusion and junk that is, and now their Christianity is being taunted by some as a hate crime. Because we would speak the truth, hopefully, in love. Doesn't mean you're not passionate about what you speak. I can get very passionate about what I speak. And hopefully it doesn't come across all the time as angry, but passionate. If you're about to drive off a cliff, I, hopefully I'm not even going, hey, you may want to hit the brakes. Hey, you may want to pay attention here. The bridge is out. No, I want to have a little passion in my voice to say, you are living a lie that is, that is going to destroy you and to speak the truth in love. There's so much going on in our world today. And then we're so self-centered, so, so self-absorbed. It's either, you know, we're so afraid of, be, of being offensive and that, that we're so concerned about ourselves that we're, we're thinking about ourselves so much or we're, we're walking so much pride we don't care at all about anything else going on. And, and our, our culture needs us to look to Jesus and to consider him. Theologian, pastor, writer years ago, Robert Murray in Cheyenne, he, he wrote this. He said, learn much of the Lord Jesus. For every look at yourself, take 10 looks at Christ. Let your soul be filled with the sense of the excellence of Christ. I don't know about you, but that hits a little hard. I probably spend too much time thinking about me. Thinking about what people think about me. What do they think when I said that, when I didn't do this, how I said that, when I, what do they think? How did, how, did, how did that impact? Are they mad at me? Are they upset with me? We think about ourselves, and a great remedy of that 
would be to think about Jesus more than we think about ourselves. For every look that you take at yourself, take 10 at Christ. How much healthier would we be? Instead of thinking about me, thinking about how you perceive me, and think, if I just thought about Jesus all the time, how much healthier, how much more peace and grace would permeate in my life? We look to Christ. That term Christ, again, I've alluded to it, Christos, anointed one. Under the old covenant, there were three offices, three categories of people that were anointed. You had the king who would be anointed. You had the priest that would be anointed. And you had the prophets that would be anointed. The kings would be anointed to lead and to govern with authority the kingdom of God, the, the Israel the representation of God on earth. They would, or, they would operate in this kingly authority. And their authority was to deal with spiritual rebellion at times. A king had authority under the old covenant that day and age that if you were out of line, out of order, outside of the, the kingdom's dictates, laws, and, and, and commandments, that they could kill you, just execute people that were outside in rebellion. Well, in the new covenant, Jesus Christ steps in and he fulfills the king of king role. And he takes all of his kingly authority. And you know what he does with it? He judicially declares that you are now forgiven because the wrath of God was poured out on him on the cross. What other king would leave his throne and get on a cross? and take the judgment that he has been given to judge and had the right to judge you and I guilty. And he turned that and allowed the wrath of God and the judgment of all the law to be poured out on himself. What a kingly act. The high priest was responsible for representing the people to God and God to the people as a mediator. And they would sacrifice lambs in the morning and, and lambs in the evening to cover the sin of the people. And there were offerings throughout Leviticus, you can read about this, that the people of God would bring to God. There were sin offerings. There were uh, libation offerings. There were guilt offerings. There were different offerings throughout the Old Testament. That, and that cost the people. They had to take of their flock. They had to take of their bounty, the, the, the grain offerings and the, the, those wave offerings, and they brought it in. Jesus, as the high priest under the new covenant, he offers up a sacrifice once and for all, and he is the sacrifice. And he also takes on the prophetic role. The prophetic role deals with spiritual ignorance. If you read through the Old Testament, the prophets of God were anointed by God and raised up to speak to the people of God when there was hardness of heart, when there was rebellion and spiritual ignorance. They would speak the word of God. And most of the time, this is a generalization of the message, but it was like, hey, stupid, wake up. All right, that's 10, kind of how it reads anyway. I don't know if that's how it says it exactly in the Hebrew. But the prophets would come at them and go, quit. Quit rebelling, quit sinning. And Jesus takes on the prophetic role. And let me, let me deal with, I'm gonna mainly just deal with the prophetic role that Jesus handles in our day and age and how we are to align with that ourselves for our culture's sake. We're not to hate the people around us. We can hate and despise our culture because culture is not uh, redemptive, but we, can, we need to love the people of our culture. Right? The old school, we say, love the sinner, hate the sin. And I don't know if we ever got it really right, but we ought to try real hard. Amen. Preach. Thank you for the nod and the two uh-huhs. New Testament. Genesis, well, Genesis. Let's take Genesis chapter 6. And this is, this is why we are where we are today. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. It says, every intention of the thoughts of his heart on ma mankind was only on evil continuously. Therefore, today, man's hearts, men and women's hearts and minds, they're skewed in the wrong direction towards darkness. The psalmist in Psalm 14 and 53, they both start the psalm off this way. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. I, this week, spent some time watching atheists talk about religion, just scrolling through a bunch of videos watching atheists talk about religion. There is so much arrogance, so much pride in their voice. 
I'm t- here to tell you, though, that even if they say there is no God and they've got all of their own little thought processes that will hold that up, there are futile minds in their heart. They have become foolish to say that there is no God. In the New Testament, Paul will write this and say, they became futile in their thinking. They can get puffed up in their thinking. You can read a book. You can watch a professor and be awed by their academic prowess, their intellectual abilities. They may be very, uh, or they can uh, communicate much better than I can right now. They can communicate and they've got that ability and you're wowed by them. But I'm here to tell you, their thinking, no matter how impressive it is, it's futile. And this is what the word says. And their, their foolish hearts were darkened. So their heart becomes darkened to the spiritual things, and then their thinking shifts, and it becomes futile. Oh, later on, Paul will write in Ephesians 4, 18, he'll say, they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of heart. So somewhere, somehow, in our thought process or in, in, in the mentality of society proper, we have allowed our hearts to get hardened to the voice of the Lord. And then we grow ignorant and then we're alienated from God by being in darkness. Christ, though, is the light of the world. And he is a prophetic light. And when he burst onto the scene, he's not only the light of the world, the word says he is the word. Amen. And so he is a light that speaks. He is a light that has voice and sound to him. And so when the light of the world shines into the darkness, he releases a prophetic sound. And the sound is the sound of the announcement of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news that there is salvation, there is freedom from darkness, freedom from bondage in Jesus' name, the gospel news. He started off with his announcement at the Sermon on the Mount. We don't have time to go through a whole lot of it, but the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus speaks, he speaks one thing, and this sounds, wow, this is heavy, but he says to them in Matthew 5, verse 20, he says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, then you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, he is saying, if you think you are smart enough, if you think you can do this on your own, your self-righteousness has to exceed that of the Pharisees. In other words, he says, there is no human way possible to find heaven except for resting on the work of the cross. So he's bringing them to their end, this spiritual prophetic word, light being shown in spiritual darkness. I read this, Thomas Watson, he writes this, children are afraid of the dark. And I went, yeah, I get that. They're born with this just responsiveness. Most kids just have this innate fear of the dark, the unknown. I mean, night lights, I mean, I wish I had invented them, right? It's a like, multi-million dollar invention, these little night lights, to dispel some darkness. But in reflecting on how kids are naturally afraid of the unknown and of the darkness and don't want to dive into that, he goes on to write this, yet adults are not afraid of spiritual darkness. But the spiritual darkness is not accompanied with horror So men tremble not at their condition, nay, they like their condition well enough. The darkness of your heart, the darkness of society, sometimes we find solace in the darkness. We pull back in the darkness because hopefully no one sees what we do in the darkness. He sees and he knows. And his prophetic voice is always calling to you to step out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. One of the greatest deceptions of the enemy is that the light of the gospel, the light of his glory is terrifying. And the darkness is safer than the light. So the enemy comes to twist even the truths of the scripture. Oh yeah, there's light over there, but his light is so, you can't stand his light. And his light is so judgmental His light's going to be damning to you. But the word of God says this, the prophetic light that has voice, when the light of the gospel shines, the light of the gospel has voice because he is the word and the word was with God and the word is God. So when the light of the gospel, he calls you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 
Some of you have experienced the light of his glory. And you know how joyful it is. And there's a 1% or a 10% or maybe a 99% crevice of your heart that is still in darkness. And how the enemy shifts our minds to want to keep that 1% or 2 or 10% of darkness still dark. Because though we have tasted and seen that he is good, and though the marvelous light has been blessing and glory and warmth and gentle, it's been marvelous. There is now, even though we're 80% in, this 20% that we still want to hold back, we're still afraid that this part will be terrible instead of marvelous light. What ignorant logic. And the prophetic voice is to call us out of our ignorance into his presence. John three nineteen says this, people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. But the light of the world has appeared to all men, to all men, to those that deny him and those that receive him. The light has appeared. John Calvin once said this, the heart of a man is a perpetual factory of idols. I don't know if you have found that to be true. I'm not an old man, even though I claim to be an old man a couple of weeks ago when I talked about having a dream from God. But at 47, the longer I live, the more I realize that, man, the heart can produce idols quickly. As quickly as I give something to the Lord, a relationship, a desire, a sin, whatever it might be, there is something else in line waiting to become an idol and to take Christ's spot on the throne. Anybody ever else, you, you dealt with something, you're like, man, I got that under the blood. Man, God has delivered me from that. I'll never deal with that again. And you're free from whatever that was. But in a day's time, you're like, man, I have put another idol right in that thing's place. We idolize the gift we idolize our ability, we idolize a relationship, we idolize a sin, we idolize something, we allow it to happen. William Temple said this, every day in a thousand ways, I make myself the center of the universe. How often do you do that? Whether I'm God's gift or woe is me, nothing ever good can happen because I'm so broken. And you end up making yourself the negative God, that you're so broken that God can't even help you. A thousand times a day, we make ourselves the center of the universe. And Paul says it's something like this. Who can deliver me from this wretched body of death? Thanks be to God. Because of Jesus Christ, he is the prophet that speaks the truth. And when he speaks the truth, his truth shall set us free. Amen? Amen. Give him praise. He is worthy. He speaks the truth in love into my situation. Oh, I heard one minister once say that Jesus is, he is strong, but his strength is never abusive. He is gentle and he is lowly, but his humility, it is never weakness. He is so strong and kind and caring. And when he speaks the truth in love, it may prick and it may hurt, but it's going to set me free. And oh God, allow us to be prophets of God in that vein with you to speak, to dethrone the ignorance and the lies that we believe. Hebrews says this in chapter one, long ago and at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. We have the prophets that would speak to spiritual ignorance and things of that nature. But in these last days, he has spoken. And I like that. It means it is finished. He has spoken to us by his son, the true prophet who speaks to us. Oh, and his prophecy is woven all the way back to chapter three of Genesis. Chapter 315. They say it's the first mention of the gospel when he will crush the head of the serpent by the power of the cross. And then a little bit later in Deuteronomy chapter 18, Moses, who's a prophet, he stands and he says in verse 15, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. And then he goes on to say, God says, I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak them all that I command him. Jesus is the prophet of God and his word is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. And we ought to hear the word of God, hear the prophetic word of God, hide the word in our 
heart and allow the word then to come out of us and order our steps and to guide our path in freedom and in grace. Amen. Jesus says in John 17, this is his prayer to the Father, a powerful prayer. We go to the Lord's Prayer. We call it the Lord's Prayer. It's the model prayer when he taught them how to pray. The Lord's real prayer is found in chapter 17 of John. If you don't understand that, that's okay. I don't either. All that I just said. Now, Jesus praying, he says this to the Father, now they know that everything that you have given me is yours. We hold to that. For I have given them the words that you gave me. He spoke the word and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you and they have believed that you sent me. That's our, that's our calling, being called out of darkness into his marvelous light is to align with the word that Jesus has spoken and realize that he is a great savior. Jesus, and I won't take you there, but in Samaria, this forbidden area, he's walking through and he meets the woman at the well at the wrong time of day. She shouldn't be there then. Many of you, if, you, if you're a believer, you've, you've heard this story. If not, you need to go read it. It's a powerful story. He runs into this woman who has had a, a lot of husbands and she's living with the guy so she doesn't like society because society doesn't really like her. So she sneaks out in the heat of the day to get water and Jesus shows up in a place he's not supposed to be to talk to a woman that nobody wants to talk to. And they get into a theological discussion. I don't know about you, but sometimes I've had conversations with people that don't want to talk about the issue. They want to talk about theology. We want to get off on these other things. We want to split hairs about these little things here and there. And she's talking about theology. She's talking about worshiping God. And it sounds really good. And she knows her stuff. She's quoting the the prophets and she's going back and forth. And then she finally gets to this point. And I've done this in some conversations with some of you. I'll get to the point and I'll go, you know what? When Jesus gets back, he'll sort it all out. That just means I'm done talking to you. You're asking me these tough questions. I'm like, you know what? When Jesus comes back, he'll sort it all out. I'm tired of talking to you. You're wearing me out. Because we're arguing over a part of theology. And you may be passionate about it. That's fine. Be passionate about it. I've already written all the papers. I'm not as passionate about it anymore. I got the, I've got the word doctor hanging in my office. Just, uh, I'm done studying. I will keep reading this and keep preaching this. So I don't want to argue. I don't know. That was therapeutic for me, and I hadn't even been arguing with anybody lately. <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> Lord, forgive me. But she says to Jesus as they're arguing, she says, when the Messiah comes, he's going to sort all this out. And he goes, boom, got her. I don't think he reads that way in the Greek. I didn't take time to read the Greek, but, but he does say this. He says, I who speak to you am he. Revelation in that moment. And a lady that would hide and a lady that would fight with theology and a lady that would all of the sudden, because now all the theology stuff, the prophet spoke. And he revealed himself to her. And all of a sudden, all of this sin that she had been running from and hiding, she ran right back headlong into Samaria and started preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. In a place that, quote unquote, wasn't theologically ready, wasn't supposed to be exposed to the gospel. It's Samaria, half-breeds, not supposed to get Jesus. In a place that's not supposed to get Jesus, to a woman that's not supposed to get Jesus. Now she becomes a prophet and a minister and an evangelist in Samaria herself, and the whole city comes out. And he's like, it's amazing. So when you let the word of God and the prophet of God, when you let him speak the word of God into you, you will come alive. And the word and the stuff, the sin, the darkness, the blackness that you've been hiding from, you will step into his marvelous light and you will run right back into a society that you were trying to hide from and you will speak the truth in love. And that's who we need to be today. That's what God wants us to do. I think of, of this as well, the, the Emmaus Road, right after the resurrection. A couple of disciples are walking, and Jesus is meeting with them in chapter 24 of Luke, and he says, Oh, foolish ones, slow of heart 
He's prophesying to them. The prophets always show up, and, and when a prophet speaks, it is about spiritual ignorance and hardness of heart. A slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And then he sits down at, and he has communion with them, and he breaks bread. And when he breaks the bread, he's revealed. And then he vanishes. And then they say this. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? A couple of things as we're preparing to close here today. You might have darkness in your heart. You may have hardness of heart in your life. You may have some spiritual ignorance. And I'm not here to make fun of that or to point that out or to speak condescending towards your spiritual ignorance. But you may have some spiritual ignorance and you may have some hardness of heart in your life because you have shut down the word of God and you have listened to the voice of culture. It's easy for even sons and daughters of the faith to begin to listen to the culture around us more than we listen to the word of God. Why? Because I've been raised in this. My mom and dad started this church. I was raised in this church. I've been raised in the faith. I have read the Bible. I've read it a lot. And it's easy to be reading the Bible and go, I already know it. Is that too much? Is that like just too real? To be like, man, I've already read this story before. I know what it means. I blah, 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 and you, you, you get through the story and then you're like, now I got to go do real stuff. And then you listen to Twitter and TikTok and Facebook and Instagram, and you get your influence from there instead of what you think you've already finished. But the Word of God says this, the Word is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. And you can sit at the feet of a professor that says they know what they're talking about, but if it doesn't align with this, then you need to say, you're wrong. I don't care how many doctorates you got hanging on your wall. I don't care how many books you've read or written. This is what I check. How many of you been in that journey before? You, you've been walking the walk, and, and there's this everything on paper looks good. Everything about this decision looks good. And you want to go down that path, but you just can't take that. You can't go through that door that's open because there's something in you, the presence of the Lord, and put there by the reading of the Scripture. The Word of God says He will be a lamp to our feet. The Word will. And all of a sudden, you won't go down a path that on paper makes so much sense. You've done all the math. You've done all of that. But it, it doesn't. There's no peace there. And then there are those days that you can't see uh, your hand in front of your face because there's so much cloudiness. But there is a peace that passes understanding and says, step son, step daughter, I will take care of you. And you step into the unknown because his faith and his presence go with you. His word is a, a lamp. His word is alive and active. His word will not return void. When he speaks it forth, we hold to it. So some of you may have some darkness in your life because you've been listening to the world or to a friend or to a peer, and you've not, even a minister, even a church, because we, we don't have it all. We are, we are not the depositors of, of the scripture. You get into the word yourself. You read the word in prayer. Let the word get in you. Hide the word in your heart. Alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. I, I, I don't care if you, you only have a little New Testament and, and Psalms, you don't have the whole Bible. Get into one chapter. If you can barely read, get into one chapter. Chapter, read, read one scripture. Read that one scripture every day because it will continue. He will continue to speak to you volumes through three words that are from his mouth. More than books, more than podcasts, more than any of that other stuff. Oh, you can feel so enlightened and intellectual. But let the word, and I'm not saying throw all that away. I listen to other people. I, again, I've got a degree. I've done that stuff. But, but if it does not align with this, it's hogwash. And that's the technical term. The word of God. So those of you that have darkness, spiritual darkness, allow me today to stand as a prophet of God. 
and to speak the truth in love and to call you out of darkness into his marvelous light. If it's religion that's hurt you, with all due respect, find some way to get over that hurt. If it's religion that's hurt you, the term, you know, church hurt and all of that, you know, find some way to don't, not divorce yourself from the church, but to forgive the church and find healing. Because the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. And I can hurt you, I can let you down, I can disappoint you, I can be wrong a thousand different ways in my attitude, in my, in my thought, in my speech. I can be wrong, but he will never leave you nor forsake you. He will speak the truth and his word will not return void. Get in to the word. And then last, so, so you may have some darkness in your life and you need God to speak to that darkness. But then there's some of you in this room, you know the Lord, you're walking with the Lord, but like me, on the stage, I'm an extrovert, but I put the mic down, I'm more of an introvert. And you see society, and you see the brokenness of society, and you see situations in your own life. And let me encourage you to be a prophet of God, to be a mouthpiece for God, to speak the name that is above every other name. Not your opinion, not your politics, not your this or your that, not your philosophy, but to speak into every dark situation the name of Jesus that is above every other name. Not a, an incantation, not a magic formula, but the intimate name of Jesus that you know, that you've hidden the word in your heart. Speak the name of Jesus in every situation. You care enough about your friends and your family to speak the name of Jesus into their life. You don't wanna see them drive off the cliff of philosophy or drive off the cliff of, of this culture or drive off the cliff of enlightenment or wokeness or whatever other demonic thing that's going on in their life. You want to speak the name of Jesus over their life. Amen? In love. And that means you might have to pray the name of Jesus for six months before you have a conversation with them. Because your conversation may get real fleshly real quick because you're predisposed to that. But I'm asking you to speak the name of Jesus over your family. Speak the name of Jesus over the society that we're engulfed in, that is squeezing and conforming us into its mold. Why, Jeremy, why? 2 Corinthians 5 says this, therefore we are ambassadors of Christ, for Christ. And God is making his appeal through us. So please allow the Spirit of Christ to plead through you. We implore you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. Why? Why so much pride in the Bible? Why so much pride in the name of Jesus? Well, there is no other name. There is no salvation in any other name. None. But they're a good person. They're a little confused in their sexual identity. They're a little confused by society at this moment. They, they've been, they've been uh, indoctrinated by this philosophy or that, and they're, they're such good people. They are good people, I get that. But there is no salvation in any other name. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. If you love them and you care for them, speak the truth in love. Quit telling me how much you love them and you're gonna pat them on the back as they die and go to hell. We need prophets of God that will speak the word of God in truth. And again, hear me. Methodology, I'm not, don't you dare hurt them with the Bible. Don't you dare beat them down with religion. Speak the marvelous prophetic light of Jesus that is calling them out of darkness into his marvelous light. And you know what? I don't know how to do all that. I don't have that figured out. But in every situation, he will make a way out. If you will listen to the voice of Jesus, 
He, and you're just praying under your breath, Lord, help me, Lord, help me, Lord, help me. Lord, help me, Lord, help me, Lord, help me. We are in deeper waters than I've ever swimmed in right here. Have you been to those conversations? You're like, I've got nothing. You have said things that I have never even considered. And you said them like they're true. And we are not even in the same universe. I mean, I've been there. But you have to go, Jesus, help me. Speak truth into this situation. Bring light into the darkness. Now, Jesus, he said this about his culture. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. Here I am telling you to go preach the gospel and just said, they may throw a rock at you. You may get rejected. They may laugh at you. They may, they may bow up. They may sever their relationship with you because they think you're weird. But you know what? You need to speak the name of Jesus. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. I want to close with this old song. I'm not going to sing it. Rescue the perishing. It's what we ought to be about. Allowing the gospel. What happened in heaven after the ascension? Jesus sat down at the right hand of the Father. And he was bestowed with the name that is above all other names. Now what happened on earth? The great commission that he had given out. The power of the Holy Spirit fell. And a group of people got on fire for Jesus. And they started preaching the gospel everywhere they went. They started telling the people that they were rubbing shoulders with the day before. That they were now wrong in their thought process. That's hard to do. That can come across as arrogant, but it is a revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some of you have been hanging out with friends and you've been allowing them to live any way they want to. Today, not because of my words, but because of the word of God, there's a new revelation going on in your life. And you're going to be so miserable by not opening up, because here's my prayer, that you become like Jeremiah. Fire shut up in your bones if you won't re release the word of God into their life. Why? I'm introverted. I hate conflict. I hate that. I hate anybody. I hate being rejected. Like, if you do me wrong, I want to apologize to you because I want us to get along. I want us to be okay. But you know what? We need to have a fire of God in our bones that we would speak the word of God. Rescue the perishing. Care for the dying. Snatch them in pity from sin and grave. Weep over the erring one. We've lost some of that. Lift up the fallen. Tell them of Jesus, the mighty to save. How sweet the name of Jesus sounds prophetically. Jesus, my shepherd, husband, friend, my prophet, priest, and king, my Lord, my life, my way, my end, accept the praise I bring. Lord, let our lives be a prophetic utterance of the light of the gospel everywhere we go. In Jesus' name.